Welcome to today's webinar, Engaging Ways to Address Distracted Driving at Work. During today's presentation, attendees will be in a listen-only mode. If during the program you would like to submit a question, please use the chat pod which is located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, type your question in the box at the bottom, and click Send. If you have any technical difficulties, you may contact the Help Desk, and that number is 877-297-2901. Now I'll turn things over to Bridget. Bridget Ballack, please go ahead. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being on today's um, webinar. Um, I just wanted to thank you first of all for taking the time to learn a little bit more about what we're going to um, present today. And I wanted to let everyone know that we will be recording this webinar. And after the webinar is over, we will send everyone who is registered for this webinar a link to it. So um, you will have a recording of it and then you can share it with folks who might not have been able to um, be on this call as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Lisa Robinson, who is a Senior Program Manager with the National Safety Council. She's responsible for employer traffic safety programs. And at the National Safety Council, she works with employers to help them integrate traffic safety within their safety culture by increasing their resources and knowledge on driver behavior, distracted driving, drowsy driving, impaired driving, and other traffic safety concerns. Ms. Robinson also helps employers implement policies to decrease their risk and exposure to, li to liability, which is what she's going to talk to you more about right now. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Bridget. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm really glad that we have so many employers um, on the webinar today to talk to us about distracted driving. It is a real problem and it's become more increasingly important for employers to be paying attention. And you know, everyone's really aware of cell phones, they're really aware of texting and driving, but there's so many distractions that happen when we're hot behind the wheel. And distracted driving is anything that takes your eyes off of your task at hand, which is driving. And so, you know, whether we're talking about employees driving to work, from work, we're talking about employees going, maybe doing an errand at lunch, employees that travel as a part of their job, um, employers that may be a fleet, we're talking 100% of our employer population needs to be aware about distracted driving and be paying attention to it and making it a part of your safety culture and making it a part of your safety talk so that you're addressing some of the key points with distracted driving. You know, everyone's really quick to say it was just this. It was just a quick call. It was just a short trip. It was just one drink. It was just this. It was just that. That's the problem. It was just. And that's all it takes for one crash to happen. And employers, unfortunately, are faced with liability. There's so much risk for an employer in today's society. So you have to be aware, aware of all of those it was just and making sure that you're talking about your talking to your employees about best practices and the exposure for liability and what the risks are because it was just a picture and it was just a bite. And you know, and I've had employers share with me that this one employer shared with me he went to pick up a glass of iced tea. When he went to pick it up with his right hand, it started to cave in. He took his left hand off the wheel went to pick it up, took his eyes off the road, turned around and hit traffic at 70 miles an hour. He shared pictures with me of that, and he was on the job at the time. And so it was just a glass of tea, but it caused a crash on a highway going 70 miles an hour. So you have to understand that it was, it was just, causes just a lot of problems for the employer possibly. You know, and not only that, but distracted driving, if it's not on your radar, it really should be. And unfortunately, we're losing an average of nine people nationally every single day I'm gonna let that sink in for a minute. Nine people every single day nationally are dying as a result of distracted driving. People get upset over so many different things in our country, but we've taken these numbers as just standard everyday numbers. We aren't outraged as a community. And so as an employer, you have the opportunity because you know, I tell people these nine people that are dying every day, there's somebody's employee, there's somebody's family member, and all of that impacts the employer. Not only that, but you're talking over 1,000 people are injured every single day as a result of a distracted driving crash. That goes to an employer's fringe benefit. So when we talk about it, you know, again, that's 3,400 lives last year. So when you talk about the 3,400 lives in 2016, those are employees, those are family members, and those cost the employer money. So it's not something that we just go, it's, you know, the cost of doing business, it should be something that we're putting in our health and safety management system, and it should be something that we're addressing. And as I mentioned a minute ago, 
distractions are everything. You, we tend to focus a lot on cell phones and, and texting and driving, which we should, absolutely. But there are a lot of other things that behind the wheel, I've seen people reading a book, a newspaper. Someone shared with me the other day, they saw a lady painting her finger or her toenails. I have no idea how that happened, and I was pretty shocked by that. But honestly, there's so many different distractions that behind, happen behind the wheel that we need to have these conversations. We shouldn't assume that our employees know that all of these, all of these behaviors are distracting behind the wheel and take their attention from their primary task, which is driving. So I think it's important to think about all of these and not simply just our cell phone conversations or our texting and driving. Risky behavior. You know, I think this is a really interesting AAA survey because it says that 87% of drivers engage in at least one risky behavior while behind the wheel. Now, that can be speeding, that can be a variety of different things, but I always tell people when we say 87%, when you're driving, look around you and think about even like your family members, your coworkers, you know, other people, 87% of drivers engage in at least one risky behavior. So when you're looking around, look at all the people around you. Maybe you might not be doing it, but other people are. So that's why it's so important when you're driving that you're driving defensively and you're paying attention and you're aware. And that's why it's really important that you're not distracted because if more than one person is distracted on the road at the same time, it's, you know, it's a recipe for disaster. So, and again, also choose something to keep in mind is fatigue because we know that when you're fatigued and 32% said they drove while they were tired, that is becoming increasingly common among um, employees that are driving and they're tired. And we know that driving is like, you know, it's like driving in pairs. So having those conversations with your employees about speeding, aggressive behavior, um, making the right choices, not driving while they're tired, putting appropriate measures in place to ensure that these things don't happen, but make it an ongoing part of your safety culture, not just one safety talk a year, but an ongoing conversation with your health and safety management system so that you're addressing it. You know, infotainment centers, everybody seems to think that infotainment centers are the answer, and these infotainment centers, you know, they are in our cars because a lot of people like them and they want them. There is a lot of ease and convenience, but they also are a distraction and being aware of that. And it may be it's something as simply as reminding your employees, before you get on the road, you need to set your GPS. Before you get on the road, you need to set your radio stations. Before you get on the road, you need to set any of your commands with your infotainment center. And, you know, a lot of the things like Google Play and some of those other things, you know, where people can say they can make, you know, hotel reservations, restaurant reservations, order a pizza, that's fine, but it shouldn't be when you're driving. And so having those conversations with people on what the expectations are is important. Also, too, something to keep in mind, if you've got employees who use rental cars as a part of their job, it's really important that you have those conversations that they're doing everything before they leave the rental car location. I travel a lot for work, and that's the one thing is I tend to be in the rental car location a few extra minutes because I'm adjusting my mirrors. I'm making sure that everything's set. My GPS is set. My car seat is adjusted for me because everything, when you get into a new vehicle, everything's different. So you need to make sure that when you're driving, you're not distracted by adjusting that seat, adjusting that mirror, adjusting the GPS. So it's really important that you have these conversations with the employees about all of these things. Um, technology is great. Just like a minute ago, I said, you know, the infotainment centers can be a great thing with the GPS, but technology can all, again, as I mentioned, it can be a part of the problem if you're using it while you're driving. But technology can, as I said, can also be, you have the ability to reduce that technology. If you've got, um, like, employer cell phones, there are distracted driving technology that can be put on that cell phone so that calls don't come in. Because we know that when that phone pings, when an email is coming in, when a call is coming in, and we know when that ping happens, it does something in your brain where you automatically want to answer that phone. You want to reply to that text. You want to see that email. So if that phone is silent, that driver is not hearing those pings. So it's really important that you think about using um, call blocking technology on your cell phone. It's a great app, and if you're a passenger, that's one question we get asked is, well, what if you're a passenger? Is it gonna block my phone? Yes, but most of them have the ability to say, I'm not driving. You can push a button that says, I'm not driving, so that you can still use your phone when you're a passenger. But it's something really good, so you know, technology can be a part of this part of the solution, too, if you use the technology. You know, an NSC survey said that 80% of respondents believe that hands-free devices are safer than handheld. 
and 53 said they believe that voice control features are safe because they're provided in vehicles. You know, there was a crash um, several years ago, and I think it was down in the Corpus Christi area, and the driver of a Coke vehicle, and it was a pretty large lawsuit, and it was not a Coke truck, but it was a Coke, you know, vehicle. And in the deposition, she indicated that if she would have known that hands-free was no safer, she would not have been using hands-free technology. And unfortunately, what people just don't understand is the part of your brain that you use um, for that phone conversation, the same part of the brain that you use to drive. And so people seem to think because the car comes with that hands-free technology and because employers have hands-free policies or the state has hands-free policies, that they believe that that is safer. But unfortunately, that's just not true. And so we know that there's been plenty of studies done and different things like that that share to let us know that it is no safer. And so understanding clearly that there is risk there. And unfortunately, some employers are one lawsuit away from closing their doors. So you have to address risk in the, in the, in the workplace. You have to be aware of where your liability is. And so making the safest choices for your employees that reduce your risk is really important. So understanding when there's 30 studies that says there's, there's negative effects of cell phone use for hands-free and handheld is important to be aware of and pay attention to. As I mentioned before, the, the brain, understanding the brain. I, I get a lot of people that will call me and they want to say, can you teach us how to be able to use, you know, our cell phones, our, 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 um, our laptops while we're driving? And it's been a police department before and they're seeing an increased crash rate. And I'm like, you're driving faster, you're using a cell phone, and you also have a laptop going. And you're seeing an increased risk, you know, you're, in, you're seeing an increased, increased crash rate. You can't simply do it. The part of your brain that you need to drive is the same part of your brain that you need to have that conversation. It's called inattention blindness, and you need to be aware of that. Um, a lot of people don't understand it, so I'm going to show you a little bit of what happens. You can see it's like tunnel vision. So on the slide on the left, when you're not on a phone call, you see everything around you. But when you're having that phone conversation, your brain is engaged on that phone conversation because that person can't see what you see. And so you're, you're actively engaged in that conversation. And so all you're seeing is a smaller part. So you're not going to maybe see that pedestrian to the right. You may not see the bicyclist to the right. You may not see that car that might not be stopping at the stop sign. You might not see the traffic light change. There are several things that you might not see as a result of inattention blindness or this tunnel vision. So it's important to understand that when you're having that conversation, again, the part of your brain that you need to drive is the same part that you need to have that conversation with. I want to go over a few myths with you um, because this, these are common things that come up in a lot of the in a lot of the presentations that I do, and then these are some of the most important ones. And people ask about CB radios, navigation system, books on tape. All of these are simplex conversations, and they typically occur in one direction. And so, typically, that is not a problem. You're not engaged in a two-way conversation, and it's easier to disengage. So it's, it's simply different than when you're listening to that book on tape or the navigation is telling you to turn. So those are not the same as having that phone conversation with somebody. Interesting enough, something happened yesterday when I was in the vehicle with somebody, and um, it's no more dangerous than talking to a passenger. And what's interesting is your passenger helps navigate for you. I was a passenger in a vehicle yesterday when I was um, out of town at the Lifesavers Conference, and the person driving um, got ready to accelerate, and I said, you've got a pedestrian watch there on your left. Your Coworkers or the person or your co-pilot are also paying attention. So when you and your passenger are having a conversation, their eyes are scanning the roadway as well. They're also helping you to tell you when there might be something in the roadway, something near you, maybe something you don't see. Also, when traffic's heavy, typically that passenger is going to be quiet because they know you're paying attention or you're watching. But typically, when traffic's heavy, they're helping you navigate. So it's completely different. And again. When, you're, when the phone carries that certain obligatory, you know, immediacy, it's really important where that passenger sees everything that you're seeing when you're having that conversation. Another myth, there isn't enough evidence to prove that using a cell phone while driving causes crashes. It's difficult to collect that crash data, and I will tell you this, we know that about 25% of the crashes we know are a result of distracted driving. We also know that that number is underreported, because what I tell people is how many people get out of the vehicle after a crash and they tell the police officer, oh, I was doing this, oh, I was doing that. Most people are not going to admit that they were on their cell phone. 
Most people aren't going to admit that they were texting and driving. Most people aren't going to admit the different things. And, you know, we're not always capturing all those other things, like I was eating a sandwich, I was drinking, I dropped a CD, all of those different, different things that may happen behind the wheel. But just because that statistic may not be there does not mean that it's not a problem because we know that at least 25%, and we also know that our distracted driving and our crashes are increasing um, in over the last few years. They were all going down, and now they're going back up. So we've got to be aware of that. We also know that our pedestrian and our bicycle fatalities are going up significantly in the 20% range. And so all of these things are happening. So we've got to understand that a lot of people are distracted while they're biking, while they're walking, while they're driving. So just because you may not have as hard of, hard of data as you want, doesn't mean it's not occurring. I think this is so funny that this happened because um, yesterday, and I was on the, I was, I had just landed, and I texted to tell my husband that um, I, my flight had just landed. I was, I was on my flight, and it actually, it, it auto corrected that I'm on the flooring guy. So my husband replied back, "Tom, you're on the flooring guy." It auto corrected from flight to flooring guy. And so, you know, people seem to think that voice texting is better. The problem with voice texting is it's more distracted than typing a text because you check it, you look at it, and most of the time when there's a text that comes through when you're looking at it and you voice texted, you've got to correct something. Just like I mentioned when I was telling my husband I was on the flight and it auto-corrected to I'm on the flooring guy I'm instead of I'm on the flight, you know, and I, I, you know, I didn't check it, double check it. But that's part of the problem is you're looking away too long and so your eyes are off the road. So people seem to think that voice texting is a great solution, but it's really not. And it's no safer. It's probably a little bit more dangerous as well. So um, I want to talk a little bit about policies. You know, I think some important things for the employer is, what are your policies? Have you reviewed them lately? We do a lot of training. That's one of the things that we bring up is, when's the last time you've reviewed your policy? And a lot of times we ask employees that are sitting there in training, do they know their policies? A lot of times, employers have employees sign policies, or they go over those policies at new employee orientation, but those policies aren't revisited again. So it's really important that your employees understand what your policies are. It's also important as an employer that every year you review your policies. Are they the best policies? Are they the best practice you can have? You know, and then another question is, are they effective? Is everybody following your policy? And I always tell people, if they're not following your policy, is your management following your policy? Because your safety leaders are the best people to enforce your policies and be the best example. And again, as I mentioned a second ago, are they enforced? Because if you're not enforcing that policy, but you enforce other policies, you could have liability on your hands. And if you're only enforcing it with some employees, but not all employees, again, that's another risk. So you need to be aware of what your policies are, and they need to be effective, and they need to be enforced. And again, what is your risk for liability. And so you need to be aware of that when you're looking at your policies and have those reviewed regularly. You know, speak with your legal counsel as well. But it's really important that, again, those employees understand what those policies are and they understand what the consequences are for breaking policy. You know, liability has been found in many different ways, and it's important to understand there was one where an employee was using a personal cell phone, personal car, on personal time, but making cold calls to customers, which was standard practice. The employer was held liable in that crash because it was standard practice. So again, understanding what the expectations are of your employees and making sure they're aware of that. What are the policies? What are the rules? What are the expectations? The employer needs to make sure that they're protecting themselves, and the best way you can do that is have good policies that are clear, that are enforced, and that your employees understand. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I want to introduce next um, Sean Curtis. So Lisa kind of talked a little bit about, you know, what the risks are and what li like the fact that des distracted driving can be a liability for employers and employees. Um, and so what Sean Curtis is going to talk about is how what he did in his workplace to negate some of those risks and what was successful and what was not successful. Um, so Sean Curtis is the Risk and Safety Manager for MedStar in Fort Worth, Texas. He has held several roles throughout his 18-year tenure in EMS, including paramedic, operations supervisor, and support services manager. Sean has a Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Management and maintains his paramedic certification. 
Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Bridget, and thank you, Lisa, for your uh, insight there. Um, so I wanted to talk very uh, quickly on some of the things that we did here at MedStar um, to address some of the risky behavior that we knew was occurring um, but we're having difficulty managing. So to start off, just to give you an idea who the heck we are, um, MedStar is basically the ambulance company that serves Fort Worth in Texas and 14 of the surrounding cities, a survey population of about 1 million people um, covering 400 square miles. And on an average year, you see there in 2016, uh, our 350 drivers covered over uh, 3 million miles. So every day they're doing two to 300 miles of driving in an urban setting. Um, so a lot of opportunity for risk there um, that we'll cover a little bit into the, the discussion here. So we had done a great job, or we're doing a great job, of presenting this very positive public image, right? We're, we're saving babies, we're reducing uh, response times, we're engaging the community in a bunch of very positive ways, uh, but we had a secret, uh, one that wasn't well known um, but was going to bite us uh, pretty soon, and that was our significantly growing level of risk. Um, you can see in 2011 we spent uh, almost $200,000 just on bent metal repair. That doesn't include liability, that doesn't include injuries, any of those. That is just fixing equipment. Um, and each year the number of collisions that we were having that were costing us, we set a benchmark at 500 or more. Um, the number of collisions that we're, we're having to, to manage uh, were growing significantly, in, including the cost associated with, with managing those collisions. Now, it wasn't for a lack of trying. We had done several things, we're doing several things, thought we were doing all the right stuff. We had policies in place saying, you know, be safe drivers, use your due diligence, um, understand that you're, you know, driving with other distracted and not experienced drivers. But despite that, we were still having trouble. We had a black box system within the truck. It clicked and whistled and made some noise at you if you, if you drove too hard or too aggressively. Um, and there was monthly reports that came out with some data points that showed that as an organization, we had some risk, uh, but nothing specific. Uh, we were doing a CVO training, which is Certified Emergency Vehicle Operator Training. So they'd come in, we'd train them uh, as new employees, and then we kind of set them free out into the field, um, hoping they would do well. We spent time with, with, with trainers. And then if something happens, we'd bring them in to do an incident review board. A collision happened, uh, a minor event happened, we'd bring them in and have a, have a conversation about that. But the problem with all of those things is we were chasing lag measures. So we were training them at the, at the start, saying here's the policies, here's the rules on driving, and, and here's your, your initial training, and then we'd set them free and sort of hope that nothing happened. Uh, if something did happen, we'd bring them in and we'd chat about it, but we'd wait basically until something bad happened, until we re-engaged that driver. Um, so we're watching these lag measures just hoping they don't result in a severe collision. Um, what we needed to do was move that. So we're looking at lead measures, looking at the behaviors that caused the minor collisions, the near events, um, before they turn into collisions and certainly before they turn into major events. Um, so we had to move that back somehow and weren't sure how to do that. So the question was, how do we engage our drivers? Now, like many of you listening probably, we, we, had a, we have a very young population. Um, most of our EMTs and paramedics coming to work uh, for us are 19, 20 years old with just a couple of years of, you know, Honda Civic driving, and now we're going to put them in a five and a half ton ambulance and tell them, be careful. Um, additionally, they're very autonomous. Uh, they come into our deployment center, they spend about 20 minutes of their 12 hour shift uh, in contact with us at the, at the deployment center, and then they go out. They're deployed throughout the city, um, sitting at gas stations, parking lots, different places, basically waiting for calls to come in because we're a very busy system uh, that doesn't allow for, for stations. Um, again, like many of you probably listening, we've got a lot of type A personalities. EMS seems to bring those folks in. Um, they need to make decisions quickly. Uh, they, they, they are a driving force and they know what's right. Uh, on top of that, they're, they're invincible, right? I can tell them, hey, don't drive bad or don't do risky things because you're going to get hurt. Well, no, I'm not. I've never gotten hurt doing those things and I'm never going to get hurt doing those things. Um, so I had to find a way to really motivate and engage that population. And as well, we've got dynamic deployment. That means instead of everybody starting shift at 7 a.m. where we could have a quick meeting and, and talk about a couple of things, we've got 112 different shifts that start at different times throughout the days, different days of the week, and so nobody is ever here at the same time. And if they are, they are it's off-duty at a significant expense. 
So we talked a little bit about cameras in the safety committee. We said, are, are cameras a viable solution? Now we had looked at cameras in the past and they were strongly rejected uh, because folks don't want to have a camera in their face all day, which I completely understand. I spent a lot of time in the field and if somebody proposed, well, I'm going to put a camera on your windshield and watch you all day, uh, I would have had a tremendous amount of opposition to that. So we had to figure out how to overcome that. We know as an autonomous workforce I can't be out following every driver all the time um, to figure out what's going on and, and where the risk is occurring, but we somehow had to, to bridge that gap between initial training and the risky or, or the, the bad event. Um, so I had to bridge that gap. Cameras seemed like the best solution, so I had to figure out a way to safely roll those out where everybody was comfortable with it um, and understood the, the value uh, behind it and, and really the intent of the cameras. Um, but in addition to that, what do we do with that? So I can't just buy uh, a program or a piece of hardware and expect that's going to fix my problem. Um, there has to be some level of engagement from the leadership team, um, from the front line, from everybody for an effective program uh, to take place. So who's going to review that video? If I do use a camera, who looks at all that? Uh, we talked to some other folks that were using cameras and they had FTEs specifically designated to come in and sample uh, just so many hours of video every day. Uh, we produce about 360 unit hours each day, which means 360 uh, payroll hours of, of folks on the streets, and I didn't have the FTEs or the budget to support watching uh, that volume of uh, content on a daily basis. Um, also, what do you do with it? Where do I store it? What are the policies behind it? And then how do I retrieve it? I can't chase down all the trucks to pull, manually pull video off of, off of the vehicles, so I needed to find a system that would work well and achieved um, all of our other goals as far as m maintaining employee privacy or the perception of privacy um, and an effective program. Uh, so we did end up using a camera. Um, we put those in the truck, but they were designed that they are only triggered uh, if the driver triggers them through some risky maneuver. That is, they push the truck too hard in any direction, they ex exceed a, a certain speed threshold, and then those are all managed by an external company um, who identifies risky behaviors. So they filter through all the content and identify these are the things you need to really focus on and re-educate your drivers on and give that back to us. So we decided we're going to try this out. We're going to try this program out. We first wanted to look at risky behavior. Um, we put the cameras in the truck uh, in May of 2014 and we expected a, a much bigger Hawthorne effect. We expected really we're going to see a lot of risky behavior at first, but folks are going to remember, crud, I'm, I'm being watched, the camera's here, and I, I'm going to change my behavior because I'm being watched. Uh, you can see that in the passenger unbelted. Passenger unbelted was initially very high. They said, crud, I'm being watched, I better, I better watch out, and they started self-correcting that problem. What was really interesting is the use of cell phones and distracted driving was so ingrained in their normal function, what they did on a normal everyday basis, that it didn't change at all. If anything, it started to creep up. They got more comfortable. They, they thought, well, the camera's here and it's fine because this is what I always do and I'm safe doing this because I feel safe doing this, that they didn't change it on their own at all. Um, so we said push the button, get to, you know, you can manually trigger these cameras, push the button and trigger some videos, let us see what you see. and and help us understand where the risk is at and if cameras are even going to work for us. So of course we started seeing this ris risky behavior, but what was interesting is we started seeing something else as well. Let me give you an example of that here. We started getting a lot of these videos. If you're not familiar with the song, I've got kids, so I've heard it many times. It's an Aladdin duet there. Um, but these are two uh, very husky firemen um, singing Disney tunes as they're you know, driving down the freeway here. Um, and we started getting a lot of these. A lot of folks sitting in parking lots performing these sorts of things and realized, hey, this might actually work. Uh, there might be an opportunity here that we can engage our drivers, identify risk behavior, and redo this entire program to get ahead of these lead measures. So we fully implemented the program uh, May 5th, 2014 um, and started with monthly reports. Uh, so we were coaching drivers as risky behaviors came in. We would reach out to the driver and say, hey, you were, you know, you were speeding, uh, you weren't wearing your seatbelt, uh, you were distracted. Whatever the behavior was identified in the video as a risky behavior, we'd bring them in and coach them. 
Um, in addition to that, we wanted to put out a monthly report so everybody knew where they were at. Uh, if I don't talk to you very often about risky behaviors, is that because the program is dead or because I'm doing a good job or what's going on with it? Um, so we started putting out monthly reports. And I wanted to let everybody know this is where you're doing, uh, but this is also where your partner is doing. When we initially did this, we discussed do we want to do employee IDs to keep these anonymous, or do we want to put your name on it and let everybody know how you're doing as a driver. As a team event that EMS is, you're stuck in a truck in an ambulance with another driver. The committee decided that it was best to put names on there so that if your, your partner is at the top of that list, now you can engage and you can uh, monitor their behavior and, and be an incentive to them that, hey, I want to go home at the end of the day in one piece, and so whatever you've been doing, you're not doing today. Um, and this was very well received. I, I got to tell you, I was a little nervous putting this out at first. Um, how are people going to think about this? What kind of rebuttal am I, I going to get? But it's overwhelmingly positive that, hey, I'm doing a really good job, and the folks at the top of the list that aren't doing a good job have come in and said, man, I didn't realize, I, I knew I had a couple of videos, but I didn't realize how I was doing relative to the entire organization. I'm going to fix that, and we're able to move down the list. Because people don't want to be the anomaly. They don't want to be outside of the norm. We all want to be in the same circle and, and feel comfortable doing the same as everybody else. And when you're outside of that circle, it's uncomfortable. And by putting the monthly report out there, we're able to drive that change through your own intrinsic value system uh, instead of me chasing you down on a constant basis. In addition, we did a monthly uh, sort of overall report card. Uh, so I like telling the story about there's a football team in Louisiana. Um, the hurricane comes through there and blows down the, a lot of the this football stadium, tears the place up, um, so it takes some time. Well, prior to the storm, uh, football engagement was, was very high. Everybody's excited at the games. They're cheering the teams on. Uh, lots of attendance. Well, the storm comes through, blows everything down. Uh, it takes some time, but they get to playing football again. But they notice in the stands, there's not that same level of engagement. There, there's not the cheering. There's not the carrying on. Nobody seems as excited about football as they were before the storm. So, you know, maybe it's because the storm came through. One of the last things to get repaired on that football stadium was the scoreboard. Once they put the scoreboard back up and engaged and, and, and let everybody know how the teams were doing through just that interactive scoreboard, all of a sudden that engagement came back. Everybody was excited again because now we know how the teams are doing. We see them out there running around. We know stuff is happening. But now that I know how the team as a whole is doing, now I'm engaged. Now I'm excited about it. And that's what the intent here was. Uh, what are our hot spots? You know, what are the, the behaviors that are creeping up this month? Let's, let's as, a, as a group get behind these and then celebrate the success when those numbers go down. Um, and celebrating that success was one of the biggest uh, features of this program. So on an annual basis, we celebrate our top drivers, and that's folks that go an entire 12 months without triggering a single event, which seems impossible. How do you drive around for 12 months, you know, 1,000 miles a person, and never speed, never forget your seatbelt? Uh, but we had a large population of folks that were doing that and wanted to bring them in and celebrate that, and not only with them but with their families because we, we recognize that, hey, you've got a great support system, and we want to share with your family how well you're doing, and that brings some more internal value again uh, to the employee. As well, we recognize our coaches. So the coaches doing the work, performing the action, um, we need to recognize that, hey, because you guys are doing such a great job, the entire team is doing a great job. Uh, so recognize the coach as well uh, as the drivers. But from our monthly report that we were putting out, we noticed that there was one page of risky drivers and five pages of non-risky drivers. We recognize that 10% of our workforce represented 76% of the risky behavior. So how do we engage that other 90% of the workforce? I want them to stay safe. I don't want them to forget about it or drift because nobody ever talks to them. But I don't have the budget to constantly be pouring money at them or rewards at them. So let's find new and creative ways to engage that workforce. Um, we started a program called the DriveCam Emmys. And it's boosted as a side effect my safety committee attendance significantly because now we show these videos at our safety committees. But what it is is we separate those manually triggered videos into top safety. That is, they saw something, they recognized an event um, that somebody was doing you know, a great job at, with, whether it's just they were wearing their vests on a motor vehicle accident or, or whatever it is, and capture those, and we share those with the team. We also do top musical and top comedy. And like that uh, video I showed just a moment ago, uh, that was one of our top musical uh, performances. And then at the end of the year, we nominate the top 10 uh, for the DC Emmys, the Drive Cam Emmys, and we share those at our, at our holiday party for all the families and everybody to come to and actually hand out little trophies 
uh, for the winners, and everybody gets a big kick out of it, and the trophies cost me about six bucks a piece. But everybody has a lot of fun with it. And now all of a sudden, these cameras that I've put in all the trucks are not this scary, uh, you're watching every move I make, but now they're this fun little tool that we get to have in the truck. Uh, that one, is going to help me with my driving. Two, it's going to be an objective set of eyes if something does happen that's going to tell the honest truth. Uh, but three, now it's a new way for us to sort of interact and engage not only the drivers but the non-drivers in the organization. Uh, I'm using those things for scavenger hunts. So I want you to look for the safer behavior, not just let's watch for the bad stuff, but let's actually look for the good stuff. So are you maintaining the right following distance? Uh, are you looking far ahead and demonstrate how you're looking far ahead? Um, and, and give rewards for that sort of thing. It becomes a much more positive program uh, by going outside of just watching for the bad. And so that drove a focus on relationship-based safety. So that is, I'm not just the safety guy telling the frontline employee, you got to do the, the right thing because I said you got to do the right thing. It's let's, let's begin to, to have fun with this, right? Um, let's build a program that means something to you uh, it's not just a program that you are sort of compelled by uh, your employment. Um, and so we started this infotainment, and that is I can give you information and tell you you need to read it, and that's, that's great, uh, but you're probably not going to pay attention, and you're certainly not going to remember anything I give, give you. Uh, if I'm able to somehow sneak in some entertainment, now it becomes something that you want to watch or want to engage with or want to do, and you might remember it a little bit better. Uh, we started with just you know little drone flyovers, so just a cheap drone flying over uh, some of our cones course and some of our driving patterns um, was a great way to, hey, I know you guys don't get to do this on an off often basis, but now you get to see it again. Uh, that didn't work as well uh, because they became much more interested in what kind of drone it was and where it was flying and how do you all the wrong sort of focus there. Uh, but at least they were watching the video, and so we had some level of engagement there. Uh, we do quarterly podcasts now with focuses on safety to include driving. So is, why is distracted driving important? And we talk about the functional changes in the brain, like Lisa talked about there, um, that, that tunnel vision concept and not seeing what's on the road uh, as well. Um, but we talk about everything from driving to sleep hygiene to stress management, and we bring in industry experts to help with that. So it's not just Sean talking about that. It's, you know, Dr. This talking about sleep hygiene and stress management. Um, and that then goes towards their annual eval, the number of CEs, if you will, they watch, um, credits towards their annual eval. And then initiated a just culture uh, procedure. So before we had been looking at collisions and near collisions in a preventable, non-preventable uh, state, well, that doesn't help the employee much because they just feel like, well, I'm going to get whacked for this uh, because everything is preventable because I should have been doing all these 10 things and I wasn't. Well, let's look at that holistically. Is there some system design, something I've put in front of you um, that's causing an issue. For example, uh, we switched to a new dispatching software that put a little cell phone in the truck, and that's what gave you the dispatch information, but it also gave you your routing information, and we asked you to press the buttons to change your status. Well, the intent of that was the passenger would update all those statuses and utilize the phone. The reality was the driver was holding the phone, using that to route while driving emergently and updating statuses. Uh, so you can imagine the panic attack I had when I first started seeing that. But quite frankly, that was partially our fault. We had put this tool in front of them to say, hey, use this tool, and that's exactly what they were doing. Um, they had found a better way to use it. The driver can route themselves pretty comfortably, and so they were using that. Uh, so we changed how we, how we did that. Um, but having just looked at it from a preventable, non-preventable, we would have completely whacked the employee for that and never changed the system, and it would, would have been a sustained problem. Um, in addition to some of this infotainment stuff, you know, every year at Halloween I'll dress up in little goofy, you know, safety-themed costumes. Uh, last year it was Safety Source Rex. And so we have a fun day of it. But in addition, you know, we'll take some pictures, we'll get some posters made. Um, this one was about spotting. You know, I wasn't spotting, I didn't have a spotter, so we took out one of my uh, logistics technicians. And everybody kind of has fun with it, uh, and it engages the entire workforce ver versus just my drivers. Um, this year's uh, driving refresher, you know, each year had been sort of a lecture process where we stood in front of the team, stood in front of the team and said, hey, these are the standards we expect you to follow, you know, following distance, changing lanes, all these sorts of things uh, that everybody loathed. They hated coming to it. They said, oh, I don't want to do that. I hate doing it. I know how to drive. Um, so to supplement the information part, uh, we did a few of these little, uh, I don't know, silly videos, if you will. So let's move over to that and give you an example. 
this was our smooth braking. Um, we talk about you know maintaining a stable platform for our drivers in the back, and smooth braking is important, and all that makes a lot of sense to me. But we wanted to find a way to amuse our drivers. And you remember a minute ago we were talking about constant rate acceleration. Yeah. Got to apply those same concepts to your to your braking, right? So we're gonna do some smooth braking, constant, easy going. Ready? Man, that was smooth. <laughs> So again, it's supposed to be very silly. Um, you can, you know, it's a terrible blue screen, but that was intentional uh, to sort of make it this uh, cheap comedy sort of thing. Uh, but we're trying to entertain while also providing very critical information that they need to successfully do their jobs and manage behavioral drift. Um, and then finally, we needed folks to find their own truth. So I, I can give you information and that's fine, but like we talked about with those type A personalities that are generally invincible to all things uh, risky, um, you can tell them that these things are important and this is why it's important, but that doesn't always stick. Um, so we talked about response times and talked about, you know, it takes a, ha a second and a half and generally to respond to a complex situation that is a dog in the road, you know, somebody runs out, a uh, car stops all of a sudden. So at 40 miles an hour, you know, it's 90 feet, what can happen in 90? And we go through all that and we, they start nodding off and not paying attention. So instead, we get five people in front of the room, tell them, okay, I'm going to put my hand on your right shoulder. You're going to then stomp your left foot and put your right hand on the other guy's shoulder, and we're going to move up uh, ahead like that. And then you're going to stomp your right foot and left shoulder. And we're going to alternate like that. So you have to, one, process the stimulus, that is, recognize the event, um, organize your thoughts and decide what I'm going to do, how am I going to respond to this, and then execute uh, your plan. And as we go through that, as we go through those five people, and then the last person claps at the end of it, we can in real time demonstrate how long it actually takes because everybody thinks, no, no, I'm, I'm a ninja, I'm going to respond immediately. Well, no, when I put you up in front of the class and I ask you to think about which hand goes where and which foot you're stomping and then I've got to execute that plan, lo and behold, it takes a second and a half for you to be able to do that. Um, and it's a very fun activity. Everybody gets a big kick out of it. We do it with our uh, new hires, but we also do it in our safety committee. So our non-driving employees, our business office folks and put them up there in front of the class and have them go through the activity so they get to learn those things. And, and those behaviors and, or, or information they get to, to take home with them outside of work so they become safer drivers outside. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so did it all work? I mean, put all this effort into it, built these programs, got all kinds of clever things going on. Does it even work? So I want to talk to you about my friend. His name is Oswald Molina. He is not Bruno Mars. That is a separate, they're two totally different people, um, despite the looks. Um, but Oswald had a challenge. So Oswald was a great medic, a uh, great team member, but had a very heavy foot. Uh, couldn't stop speeding, was constantly producing these, these speeding videos. And when we say speeding, you know, you think, well, you're an ambulance. Of course you drive fast. You have to drive fast to go everywhere, right? Well, we found statistically our average speed didn't improve if I was you know, doing wheelies off the line at the red light to just then stomp on the brakes to the next red light to clear that intersection. Um, so we have set limits to, to how fast they can go over the speed limit. And if they exceed that threshold, it triggers a video in the camera um, and triggers a coachable event for us to discuss with the employee. So you can see uh, Mr. Molina had 40 events in just a, a short time there. Uh, I think that was three months, four months, 20 of those being coachable events and was sustaining that high level. You can see the graph there. He was just sustaining that high level despite our interaction with him. So we said, listen, Oswald, we're buddies. I, I love seeing you, but I hate seeing you like this. So how do we get ahead of this? How do we fix this? Do I need to buy you lighter shoes? What, what do we need to do? And he said, you know what? I appreciate sort of this, the two-way conversation. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to take care of it. And lo and behold, he did. Uh, had a 74% reduction in his coachable events in just the first three months. And over the following 12 months after our conversation, he worked over 3,008 hours. And in that 3,008 hours of time, he triggered nine events, which they're 12 second events. That's 108 seconds of speeding in 3,008 hours. I, I told him, I said, you know what? In, uh, in my drive to work, my 20 minute drive to work, I probably had more than 108 seconds of speeding. So really, really good job, bud. And organizationally, we saw very similar results. Uh, so you remember earlier I showed you that collision graph. This is our collision over 500. In 2014, we installed the cameras uh, the, toward the middle of there. Uh, we had already set high numbers for our collision. In 2015, a full year of inflammation. And then in uh, 2016, uh, you can see those drop dramatically to almost nothing. 
uh, just phenomenal overall results. But what was more impressive, earlier we talked about lag and lead measures. We are looking at lag measures here. More important, our lead measures change. So that was our risky behavior. You know, the passenger unbelted. Despite these folks being paramedics and EMTs that see the consequences as unbelted drivers and unbelted passengers had some of the worst compliance I'd ever seen. Um, with that level of engagement and us really making that an important discussion, um, we were able to drive those numbers down. And you can see over the course of a year, you know, I stopped it at 15 because November 15, because it starts getting pretty boring after that. It came down and stayed down. And so it was a sustained behavior change that we were able to, to keep, uh, keep on top of. We talked about the distracted driving, the cell phones, and I thought just putting the cameras there would be enough and how that didn't change. Well, once we made that a very uh, hot topic for us, we'd always had a policy that, you know, distracted driving, we had zero tolerance for it. Uh, but once we made it a priority in our program, again, we were able to drive those numbers down and keep them down and again stopped it at 15 there uh, because it becomes a very boring line to look at beyond that. Um, what was really, excited about, uh, really exciting about this was this level of sustained behavior change. Uh, we were changing behavior permanently. We were creating new habits in our driver. And what's really exciting about that is they don't forget all of those things. These become habits. You know, they're driving 300 miles in a 12-hour period here at work. When they drive the 20 minutes home, they're not forgetting all the stuff they've learned here. Those habits that they've created here then go with them as they go off duty. So not only are they safer here driving our vehicles, they're safer at home when they're driving their families around, when they're on the streets, when they're, when they're with their friends. Um, so it creates a safer community for my 350 drivers that I can put back out into the field. Um, so very exciting for us. Uh, we were recognized by the National Safety Council for a couple years. Uh, sorry, Lisa, I missed 16's deadline. but. Uh, 2015, 2017 recognized as uh, one of the top uh, employers for our, for our initiatives on driving safety. Um, and we went from a driving culture of this, and I will warn you, um, this is a scary video to watch. Uh, there might be a little bit of bad language, so earmuffs if you're uh, not a fan. But let me see here. Went from this sort of uh, video. So a terrible collision there caused a lot of damage. We're running emergently to a call, so now we're not able to get to the initial patient that needed care, but we've created a patient, which is a stark contrast of why we're even in the business uh, that we're in. Um, we went from that behavior in 2014 to this behavior. Uh, this was last year in 2017. So had we not fully exercised and made everybody understand that, hey, clearing intersections is very, very important, and this is one of the riskiest things you're going to do throughout your shift, we would have, we would have gotten T-boned by that guy. Um, would have caused a lot of damage, likely a lot of injuries. We know those lateral collisions uh, are, are high-risk collisions. Um, but now we're looking out for those things, and not only we're we looking out for those things, our drivers are seeking out the good behavior. And you saw them actually capture that. And, while it's a violation of our policy for the driver to capture manual videos, what I really wanted to demonstrate is that the drivers are seeking out um, this positive behavior. Now we can share that um, with the other drivers, with the new employees, with our non-driving workforce uh, to, to create safer drivers throughout the entire organization. In addition to that, we had the drive cam Emmys, you know, the, the good videos. So in addition to the, the big scary stuff, we had a little of this as well. So not only are they not afraid of the cameras, but they're having a lot of fun with them too. So always glad to see that. Um, very exciting stuff for us. So talking very quickly, what, what can you do in your organization? Um, first off, you've got to set that personal example, right? If you're telling folks, hey, you can't use yourself when you can't be distracted. If you're driving, just drive. 
you first have got to set that personal example. You know, we did that here at MedStar by putting the, the cameras in all of our administrative vehicles, even the take-home vehicles, so we could demonstrate to folks that, hey, not only we're saying these things and, and, list, and you know, setting up these policies, these are policies that we believe in and we practice on a regular basis and can demonstrate that um, through our own driving. Um, but don't let folks be the distraction to you either. So don't talk with people who insist on calling you while they're, they're driving. If, if you recognize that, hey, you're driving right now, just call me back when, you're, when you get home or when you get to wherever you're going, I can wait. It's really not that important. And same thing on the other side of that. Don't be the driver that's calling. Don't, uh, you know, we appreciate that, you know, you feel safe. Like Lisa said, 80% believe that hands-free driving is, is safe. Um, but we know we've seen the functional studies. You know, we've seen all the statistics out there that, that point to very clearly uh, hands-free driving, any of those things. If you're distracted, you're distracted. Uh, so don't be the problem either. But then do everything you can uh, to educate your employees, not just your drivers, but everybody. You know, if, if you can engage the friends, the family, any way you can make a safer community because you're pushing this message out on a consistent basis, take advantage of that. Recognize the opportunities that you've got um, and get out there and, and push that message hard. But then have a strong company policy that you enforce. So early on, we, you know, we had a policy, but uh, we didn't really enforce it because we wanted folks to do the right thing, but weren't really making sure they were. Make sure you've got a way to enforce that policy. It's well understood, and all your employees are compliant with that. Um, Lisa and her team have got a bunch of free materials. Uh, with April being uh, Distracted Driving Month, we've got several of their posters hanging up around our organization. Um, they're free, they're clever, um, and a great way to engage uh, some of your folks in a new and creative way. Uh, so please take advantage of those things. And with that, I believe I'll tap it uh, back over to Bridget. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, really great information, and we have a lot of questions um, for you. Um, and the first one is from Patty McMillan, and she said, I hear from people sometimes that we have strict rules for employees not to use phones, but emergency service providers, EMS, police, and fire do. I worked in, nine, uh, in 911 for years, so I can usually address this, but what are your thoughts um, on that? So that's a great question, and, and it was a tough one to overcome for us because you're right, especially our, our supervisors, which are single resource vehicles, so there's only one person in that, in that vehicle. Um, the expectation is they are you know, a supervisor first and they just need to get to where they need to get to. So they were on the phone, on their computers, doing everything except for driving, so driving became almost a tertiary function of what they were doing. Um, so it really had to come from the, the top all the way down that, hey, this is important to us, we recognize the risk, um, we recognize there's no safe way despite all the hands-free and all the fancy toys that we can give you. There's no good way to put things or distractions in front of that driver um, and give them the opportunity to still be a safe driver. So our, our single resource vehicles, that is the folks with only one person in them, um, which was the biggest challenge is why I highlight that. Uh, for their navigation, we've transitioned to a verbal navigation system. So it actually, just like a Google or Waze or one of those sort of systems, uh, we'll actually read off those directions, uh, turn left here, turn right there, um, and have had quite a bit of success with that. Um, but then also with this, you know, drive cam or with the camera system, um, we put those in those vehicles as well. So they get enforced uh, with those drivers just the same as they do with the ambulances. So it had to be um, good enforcement from the top down, but then from a system-wide focus, how do we give the folks uh, the right tools to get the job done safely? Great. Thank you for that. Um, the next question, actually a couple folks have asked about funding. Um, uh, Patty again asked if there was issues with funding the cameras. And then some, uh, John Wentz asked if there were startup costs with anything new and um, you know, what was you know, startup cost to install um, uh, these and monitor them. So uh, to whatever extent you can answer that question, Sean. Of course. Um, so there, were, there, were, there was an initial capital investment that was to, to purchase the cameras. Um, and I can speak more about the Lytics system, but there are other systems out there. Um, I, I don't want to push one system over the other. I just know most about the Lytics drive cam system. Um, but there were uh, initial capital cost in purchasing those. Um, however, you can also lease those instead. So if, if the initial cost is going to be too much, you can lease those out so it defrays that cost over a longer period. Um, and then there are subscription costs associated with that. When we did a cost comparison between um, what are our bent metal and liability costs and what are the FTE costs associated with somebody in-house reviewing video or, or doing things like that, 
um, it was much, uh, much less expensive to pay a small subscription fee, a relatively small subscription fee to a third-party vendor to identify those, those risky behaviors um, and then send those to us. But through that, we get, you know, one, we get the cameras, which is great, but we also get an online platform that's cloud-based, uh, so I can coach drivers from a tablet, a phone, a computer, w whatever you've got, and there's a lot of versatility there. Um, and actually what generated a lot of the initial buy-in was we had a pretty nasty collision. Um, our driver was not fully aware of what had happened because he had a loss of consciousness in the collision. Um, so the, the police department was initially going to cite him. Um, they meet him at the hospital, start stroking a ticket for uh, failure to yield, basically. Was able to bring the, camp, the, the video on just a mobile device and demonstrate, hey, this is what happened. Um, and because of that functionality, because of those subscription costs that we were paying, uh, you know, contrary to some of the other systems, um, I was able to demonstrate, hey, this is what happened in real time um, and basically absolve that driver of any charges, both civilly and uh, criminally. Great, thank you. Um, another one for you. This is from Kimberly Blaney. She said, for the Drive Cam Emmys and the award for funniest song or comedy, is there any concern that this could encourage drivers and passengers to be distracted during their performance and not focus on driving? That is an excellent question and definitely a challenge that we faced. Uh, we made it very clear to folks, or tried to make it very clear to folks, that these were fun videos that you could do when you were stopped. Um, we didn't want it to be a cause to your point of, of distraction as you're driving around the city. Um, so if a video comes through like that, one, the, the team gets coached, um, but two, they're not eligible uh, for the little drive cam, maybe for the awards, um, because we don't want to motivate that kind of behavior. Great. There's, um, there's a few questions about um, the presentation, um, if, we're, if you guys can get the videos. So yes, we will, this whole presentation is being recorded and we will send this out to you so you'll have access to that as well. Um, let's see here. There's another question. How do you enforce no social media app while using, while, uh, no, excuse me. How do you enforce no social media app use while driving policy? So I think that falls into the bigger umbrella of just the no distracted driving, um, unless I'm misunderstanding the question, but it, they're not allowed to do anything on their phone uh, while they're driving. Um, so I think that would cover that. Um, is that. Is that what the question is focused towards? I believe so. Okay. Um, and then here's another question from Brenda McIntosh. If you as a company decide to place cameras in vehicles, is there a legal responsibility for employees to consent to install in vehicles or can you install because the vehicle belongs to the company and are there any privacy issue concerns that need to be addressed? So in Texas, we're able to install because they're company-owned vehicles and because the employee uh, knows they may, be in, they may be recorded. I couldn't put a hidden camera in there. Um, one party in the, that's being recorded needs to know that there is the opportunity that the event or the audio can be recorded. Um, so the camera itself is a very obvious fixture. Um, it's tough to miss. But in addition, just to sort of subjugate any concern, we put stickers on the windows for any passengers or anybody else getting into the vehicle saying, this, we utilize this camera system. There is an opportunity that you may be recorded uh, during your time in the front of the vehicle. Um, from a HIPAA uh, privacy concern, so that is the, pri the patient privacy stuff, it doesn't capture uh, any of the patient interaction or the patient audio. Um, so that was, we were able to mitigate it that way. And also through a business associate agreement, um, which is part of the HIPAA law um, that says any sort of incidental uh, HIPAA information that is released, that is, you know, the medic maybe hollers up front that Bob Smith is having a heart attack. Um, any incidental disclosures are protected uh, through the privacy agreement uh, between MedStar and Lytx. Okay. And then um, Sonia Suarez asked, how does your company enforce the engagement with upper management? So it didn't have to force it, actually. We're very fortunate uh, here at MedStar. We've got a, a pretty engaged uh, leadership team. Um, so it was, you know, I've always been sort of a silly guy, so I think this was presented as just another Silly Sean project. Um, but because we were able to show the net change that we were developing a culture of safety, not just a culture of fear behind the cameras. Um, because we're able to show that, that return on that, you know, like we talked about the sustained behavior change and the impressive 
reductions in collision costs and those sorts of things. I think all of that demonstrated that this program was overall effective and that included all the silly little engagement pieces. Great. And we have time for just a couple more questions. I want to save a little bit of time in the presentation since I know Lisa's was probably going to be a little bit longer than 10 minutes so that way we can send you the recording and it can be um, within the time allotted. So we'll take a couple more questions. Um, one question, what do you suggest for drivers that need to communicate on a company approved handheld two-way radio? So our preference is for the passenger. Um, the passenger is supposed to control the siren, do any radio, navigation, really everything outside of driving. Um, so our policy reads that the, the passenger um, does any sort of two-way communication. Now, when you're transporting, there's a patient in the back and you have to call something on the radio. Um, I haven't found a good solution to avoid the driver having to do that outside of mounting the microphone close enough that they're not having to take their eyes off the road. Um, so that falls into sort of that CB two-way communication piece um, where it's a limited exposure um, and not often a conversation so much as an announcement. Great. And then um, does the camera block any of the road for the driver? It does not. It's uh, pretty small. It's probably, I don't know, a four inch by four inch piece of equipment and it sits almost behind the rear view mirror. Um, so a very small footprint on the windshield. Great. And then last question, are these videos subject to open records request regarding public entities? So we treat them as quality assurance and that protects them. However, in a lawsuit, um, we typically present the videos as evidence. So because we do that, they would be uh, open uh, to requests. So that's the time we have for today. Thank you, Sean, for fielding all these questions and for being um, a great speaker. Thank you, Lisa, for um, starting us off. Um, again, we're going to re-record Lisa's section of it because she has some really good information, and I want to make sure you all hear that as well. So that will be emailed to you since you all registered for this. That will be sent to you. Um, Chris, do you want to close us out? Yes, thank you very much. Everyone, thanks for joining us for this webinar. We do appreciate your attention and participation in today's event. Right now I'm going to um, put an evaluation up on the screen. So to assist us in future webinars, please do fill out the, sh the short survey currently revealed on your screen. Thanks again, and you may now disconnect.